Welcome here. Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Jason Claus, and I'm a pastor here at the Open Door. I'm glad you guys could join us, and I say that every morning, but I'm actually really glad that I can join you. I'm happy to be here, and I've, I've been excited for a while about what God wants to do, and, and there's a whole bunch of different reasons, perhaps. Some of them I know, some of them I don't. Uh, as, as Karen mentioned before, uh, she is the associate pastor of the Open Door, so if you've been living under a rock for the last two weeks or didn't get the email, woo! So Karen and Doug Pearson, they're here today. Um, oh, first... Sunday officially on staff, although she was here last Sunday speaking and sharing, and she's been here for a while. So I'm really excited about that and about what God's doing this morning. So that's great. Now, the thing about camping is my daughter knows how much I love camping, and she loves camping with me, and I love camping with her. She's a little outdoor bushcraft explorer and so on. And, uh, and so when she was going to be going without me, when I, when I told her, you know, I'm, I'm really not coming with you, oh, the little tears started to flow, and you're breaking my heart, Papa, and all that stuff. And so, well, no, I gotta be. I gotta be here in Morris. And 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 she said, well, well, can you can you give me something that I can take with me? See, when I've gone on on missions, let's say, or or, or when I've been apart, then often I get her a little stuffy or something like that, a little stuffed animal, and I've I've given it to her before I left. And I said, you know, you can think of me or whatever. I don't. Know, I come up with something. This isn't my forte as a guy who was raised with brothers and figuring out daughters and all that, but I try something. Anyway, so she said, can you give me something? And I, I didn't know what she was wanting. This was the night before they left, before my wife and daughter left the Clear Lake. I said, well, like what? It's, this is like 9.30 at night. What am, and she said, can, can you give me your, uh, your, your little utility thing? And I thought she meant my, my like multi-tool pliers. Said, sure, I, I guess. So I, I brought them. She said, no, 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 your little utility thing, the thing you eat with. Well, I've got a little Swiss Army spoon knife fork thing I take camping. I love that thing. It's just awesome. It like looks like a little Swiss Army knife, but it's got all your little utensils and and I like like multi-tool camping-y gadgets. And so I said, Well, yeah, but why? You don't like the thing, you never use the thing. Like, what's what's the deal? How is this of any value to you? And here's what she said, and this kind of touched me. I have a feeling, just so you know, and, and this touched my feeling. She said, well, no, but it's special to you. And so that way, when I use it, it'll remind me of you because it's special to you. It's like, aww. So I brought the thing to her, and she hasn't. She's probably lost in the lake or something, and I'll buy a new one. But... And I thought I could preach a whole message on this idea of, of it was special to her father. And even though she didn't understand necessarily fully how to use it or why it was special, she'd never used it before, and I don't think in and of itself she wants that thing. She only wanted it. Oh, this is just driving me crazy. I'm going to destroy something here. We'll figure this all out. Even though it was special to me, and therefore it was special to her, and she wanted to share it with me. And she wanted to be able to have it and think of me. So I thought that was great. And the reality is, everybody I know, most of you here, love giving gifts to my daughter Hannah. Hannah's the kind of kid you just love giving gifts to. And maybe I'm, I'm speaking as a, an overly proud father, but I think I can legitimately say Hannah's the kind of kid you love giving gifts to because she receives them so generously and she shares them so willingly. She just loves when people give her stuff. It makes her feel, you can't really spoil her as a kid. Oh, thank you, that's so amazing. And wants to just share them with other people. Now, I was not like that as a kid. Many of you know me, some of you at least know me from when I was a kid. That's the, there's an upside and a downside to being the lead pastor of a church where you were once in diapers in. Um, is that you guys, you guys know me from as a kid. And, and I had three, well, I had two brothers. I was one of three brothers. And so I didn't receive gifts that way. Maybe because she's an only child, she can be generous because she doesn't normally have to share. I don't know. But I remember very clearly my grandpa Clausen getting me a bike, a new bike. I'd had a piece of garbage, like 50-pound steel framed something or other bike I could hardly pedal. And he bought me a new bike, CCM co-op special, whatever. But I was very happy about it. And he gave it to me. And I remember the first words out of my mouth. And I remember his face kind of falling when he heard me say this. I remember it so clearly. I was maybe eight or nine. And I said, do I have to share this with my brothers? First thing out of my mouth, not thank you. Do I have to share this with my brothers? He said, well, like, no, this, this bike is for you. Okay, good. And then I had grabbed it, and I wanted it for me. I didn't want to share it. This was my bike, mine. I'll drive it. Well, 
it's probably not surprising if I think back that I don't remember people like loving to give me gifts. I mean, maybe I have this like selective memory, but I don't think people loved giving me gifts the way they love giving my daughter gifts because I received them kind of selfishly and I didn't want to share them. And this is kind of a, a, a thing. So everyone loves giving gifts to Hannah. Nobody wants to give gifts to me. Who would you rather give gifts to, me or Hannah? Who said me? All joking aside, this was sitting a little heavy on me this morning, actually, to be honest. There is a thing. There's a thing that is a huge flaw, scar, wound, danger that follows the modern North American church around. And this is a warning and a blessing kind of mixed together, as all great blessings are also great warnings. And so I just want to draw you in for, with, us, with me for a minute as we talk about this. Because there are three groups, classifications of people talked about in the New Testament time and time and time again. And they use slightly different wording depending on which book and which author and whatever is part of the New Testament. But I want to break this down to you. There's three groups. There are, there are unbelievers. There are people who don't know who Jesus is. Whether they don't know because they were following old Jewish law or whether they don't know because they haven't been reached or they haven't heard or because they haven't had the revelation of the Holy Spirit of who Jesus is. There are people who don't know. So he talks about unbelievers. And then there are believers. There are people who've had this revelation, who have given their life to Jesus, who are ju- choosing to follow him, not always perfectly, but that we have been redeemed by the love of God. But there is a third classification of people, which we don't like to talk about, and we love to box away, and that's Pharisees, right? There's actually three groups of people, and there's Phar- now here's how we define Pharisees, not me. Right? That's our standing definition. Well, not me. Nobody has ever defined Pharisees in such a way so it includes themselves. Pharisees are maybe old bearded men who wear robes and tassels and are really grumpy all the time. That's our picture we have of Pharisees, right? What? Well, I'm not an old... I am bearded, I suppose, but I'm not wearing robes or tassels that you know of. And so I don't classify as a Pharisee. Well, and Pharisees are the ones who crucified Jesus. I didn't crucify Jesus, so then I'm good. And and Pharisees are the ones who sat in the synagogue. I don't have a synagogue, so I'm good. And we carefully zone in on the parts of what a Pharisee is that don't fit us so that we aren't in danger of being seen as a Pharisee. Now, Larry Osborne, if you don't know who he is, he's a fantastic pastor of a fantastic church. Uh, He has a book, wrote it maybe five, six, seven years ago, called Accidental Pharisee. Here's the premise. Nobody has ever woken up and decided to be a Pharisee, ever. But we all know people with a religious, pharisaical heart. So somehow, somehow, good, honest, loving believers, Christians, and churches can somehow accidentally become religious, arrogant, exclusive, judgmental, self-righteous churches and people and believers, which is what Jesus called a Pharisee which is what the Bible in the New Testament talks about as a Pharisee, by accident. And so this morning, I want to unpack a little bit about what the bare bones definition is, how we can address it, and what is the, what is so dangerous about being a Pharisee that I believe there's also a massive blessing ahead. So that's a lot to unpack in the morning. Let's dive in. I want you to turn with me, as you would when you're talking about New Testament Pharisees, to the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. Because I actually want to unwind a little bit and look at the great roots. You see, Jonah is often paired with Jesus because Jonah went down into the belly of a whale for three days just as Jesus went down into Sheol for three days when he died on the cross and rose again. And, and Jonah came back out of the belly of the whale to be a great prophet to an unbelieving generation. So they're often paired. But Jonah is kind of an anti-Jesus. He's sort of a warning of what can happen when you are almost like Jesus but not quite. You see, when we preach this, uh, this story to kids in kids' church, often, because Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, in case you're wondering, and to preach to the Assyrians. Preach to the Assyrians that they have sinned and that I will destroy them. And then Jonah runs away. And it's often either hinted or just said that Jonah was scared of the Assyrians. But the book of Jonah, Jonah himself never once says he was scared of the Assyrians. They were the terrorist murderers and pillagers of that area. They were scary people. They were a powerful, scary, semi-lawless nation. So he could have been scared, 
But he doesn't say that, and I think it's actually disingenuous to teach our kids that Jonah was scared. That's not what Jonah says. We're going to see what Jonah says. God tells him to go preach to Nineveh. He runs away, gets swallowed in a whale, gets spit out when he relents, and he says, okay, I will go do this. Goes to Nineveh and preaches. Now, everyone in Nineveh hears this and is horrified. The king of Nineveh, the king of the Assyrians, hears this and says, everybody gets a sackcloth and ashes and fast and repent that maybe God will relent and he won't do this thing. And they all go, God, we're so sorry. We've been living horrible, lawless lives and we've been a wicked generation. And they cry out to God and God says, oh, amazing. And he relents and he won't cause disaster. So if Jonah, if this whole story was about fear, then this would be the end of it, Right? The story is not about fear. The story is about a pharisaical heart in Jonah, as much as anything else. And so I want you to turn with me. The book of Jonah is very, very short. I want you to turn me to, me to the end, to Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It's also up on the screen if you don't have your Bible out with us, with you. So keep in mind, 120,000 Ninevians, I'll make that up, that's a word now, Ninevians were just saved. And here's what Jonah says. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord. He said, please, Lord, isn't this, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? Not that I was scared. Isn't this what I said in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. It's actually hard for me to read. It's convicting. I knew... I knew in my head that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love. You know we sing that song? That's quoting Psalms. There are actually two different Psalms where David sings about this. Or, 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 yeah, he was singing about this. And we sing that song still too, right? Slow to anger and rich in love. The one who relents from sending disaster. Jonah didn't want to go to Tarshish or didn't want to go to Nineveh. Because he knew God was full of love for everyone who would call on his name, and he wanted them to die. He wanted them to sit outside of God's grace, and for God to send a disaster, and for God to kill them. He wanted them separate. He had, and this is the convicting part for me, he had excellent theology. He's correct. He is saying correct things. Lord God, I know that this is your character, that this is how you are. This is your heartbeat for me. And I want it for me, and I don't want to share. I want it myself. And I want you to cause a disaster. Excellent theology, terrible application. Terrible application. Because God's love is not just for you or for us or for believers, but God's love is huge. And so no church is immune to this. No Christian is immune to this. If the devil can't keep you in confusion and cloudiness and in rebellion against God, he is just as happy, if not happier, to have you in the kingdom of believers and then to shift you out like chaff with a pharisaical heart. In fact, we're starting harvest now. We, as if I have land. Some of you are starting harvest right now. I've seen one or two combines go. What happens is you have, let's say, wheat. You have winter wheat you're harvesting. You've got, you've got all those stalks and all of those weeds and everything. And everything is designed so that the combine doesn't take that in. Especially if you're straight header combining, you're going to be combining at whatever height it is you're combining at. So you leave all that stubble behind. But what the combine takes in isn't what the combine keeps in right? You take in seed and you take in chaff because you can't get the seed without taking in the chaff. And most of that combine, most of the innards of that combine are designed to sift out the chaff and keep the seed. And so there's a front door into the kingdom of heaven, but there's a back door out, which is a fair cycle heart, which is excellent theology, terrible application. Trading a thankful heart for a greedy heart. You're trying to receive the same gift, but you're trading a thankful heart for a greedy heart, and you're trading kindness for self-righteousness. Now, I used to have all of the gifts, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. I used to despise kindness when I was a kid. Kindness? 
I got that warrior heart, and, and there's the kingdom of God to be built, and I want to go and build that kingdom. And, and sometimes you got to, you know, rub some people the wrong way and ruffle some feathers, and God's moving and God's doing stuff. Why would I pause and be kind or gentle? That sounds like weakness. And yet if you don't have kindness and a gentle heart to those around you, especially a gracious, kind, and gentle heart to unbelievers, you become a Pharisee. And you actually become repulsive to this generation. You actually can become repulsive to God. Jesus said all of his harshest words for a Pharisee. Trading a thankful heart for a greedy heart and trading kindness for righteousness will build up a list of rules and laws. In fact, Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verses 4, if you want to turn with me or you can watch on screen, Matthew 23, uh, verse 4, he says, listen, here, you Pharisees, they are bad because they tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry. They put all of this righteousness and purity law on people like a burden, and they tie it up, and it's hard to carry, and they put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. You notice Jesus doesn't rebuke them for the loads they put on them. Some of those loads are real, right? There is a call to purity and righteous living that every believer must live under. So it's not that all of these loads were wrong. What was wrong is that they wouldn't lift a finger to move them. In fact, further, just a little bit further, in Matthew 23, verse 13, Jesus says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, You lock up the kingdom of heaven from people. For you don't go in, and you don't allow those entering to go in. So now we get to the rub of it all. What was the problem with Jonah, and why is Jesus always so violently angry and so violently opposed to a pharisaical heart? Because Jesus was all about the kingdom. Remember, we've been doing this kingdom of God series kind of almost all of spring and loose over summer. We've been talking about how the kingdom of God is what Jesus said he was about. He said, I have come to bring the good news, the gospel. That's why we call them the gospels, right? The good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. And that some of us are already entering the kingdom of God and that it is coming. And we are to pray, God, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that the kingdom of God isn't just about heaven one day like Palm Springs on steroids where you can go and retire when you're done. That the kingdom of God is here and it's amongst believers and it's amongst us. And that we've received an impartation of the kingdom of heaven. But here's the problem with the Pharisee heart. It stands like a gatekeeper at an imaginary door to the kingdom of heaven and says you come through me. And God appointed us as his messengers and ambassadors to the kingdom of heaven, not as its gatekeeper. Never as its gatekeeper. In fact, I want to go a little further. And this is my takeaway this morning. You can write this down if you want to. You can remember it. You can lock this in. This is my one big takeaway I'd like you to remember this morning. You can't, you can't, we as a church can't, no denomination, no network, you cannot close the gates of the kingdom of heaven you can only close yourself off from it the harder you try to close the gates of the kingdom of heaven the more you close yourself off from the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven actually doesn't have a wall keeping people out in fact the bible says right we're gonna go with this now He said, Jesus says to Peter, and this is his words to us, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And that which you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and that which you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. We are building God's church. We are building the church of Christ. We are building the church of Jesus. And that does not make us the arbiter or the gatekeeper to the kingdom of God that makes us warriors in kindness as the kingdom of God expands and the gates of hell crumble before us. And if we try to set up new gates for ourselves and for purity and for holiness and for what ends up being self-righteousness outside of what the Bible gives us, We set up gates around ourselves that other people can't enter. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You keep people out of the kingdom of God. You don't go in and you don't allow others to go in. And so the call for us, the power for us is that God has given us his own gift of the Holy Spirit deep in each one of us. 
And the fruits of the Spirit, including gentleness and kindness and love and a radical grace that is attractive to those around you. And that attractive, radical grace draws people in literally by grace and by love and by worshiping on a Sunday morning. The gates of hell like the gates of Jericho come crumbling down around your enemies as we are called to radically love your enemy. Not just your friend, not just your neighbor, but to radically love your enemy. And as the gates of hell come down around them, they're longed in, they're drawn in by an embrace of grace into the kingdom of heaven. Where, yes, absolutely, there begins a journey of purity and holiness that you and I are on still, right? I pray, I hope. But as soon as we train a thankful heart for a greedy heart, or we train kindness for righteousness we become a pharisaical generation. See, I'm a sinner who's been saved by grace into sainthood. Bible calls me a saint. Bible calls you a saint. But I haven't earned that sainthood through self-righteousness or purity. I've received generously that sainthood, and I'm called to share just as generously. A Pharisee's heart is one that feels it has earned its grace, achieved its holiness, and therefore is exempt from kindness or is able to stand as a gatekeeper. Whereas we have been called by grace into Christ's holiness, into Christ's holiness that we put on like a garment, and therefore we're called to kindness to all. Now, I'm going to get real personal and practical here in this end because um, I've spent more years in the grace seats than I've spent behind this pulpit. And so I've been preached at more than I've preached. And I know how this game can work because it's worked like that for me, right? Some pastor comes up here and he preaches, rah, 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 here's what you do. And you throw around some words about Pharisee and kindness and graciousness and you go, mm, yes, oh, powerful words. Yeah, mm, mm. Doesn't apply to me, but powerful words. Oh, I'm glad my neighbor was here hearing that. Woo, I'm going to go home now and have some turkey. So I want to break this down. You see, Jonah didn't love the Ninevians, the people of Nineveh and the Assyrians, the way God called them to. The Pharisees didn't love Christ or the people of Christ, though they were holy and pure. So I want to start breaking down and asking some questions. Who do we, who do we, who does the North American church not love? Now, I've been reading some news articles. Let me throw out a group. Let me throw out a people group. Muslims. If you want to read some really, really, really sad anti-kingdom rhetoric, you don't have to look further than what the average North American church says about Muslims. Terrorists. Ooh. You know the Assyrians were actually considered the terrorists of their generation, of their nation? And God said, I love them so much. Go to them. Go to them and preach my love. Preach my warning. Oh, yes, that God's not altering his purity or holiness. Preach my love. Preach my love, reach out, be gracious, be gentle, be kind. Bring the kingdom through your very nature and don't close off the kingdom from anyone. Ooh, do you know what I'm scared of though? Muslims. I'm getting real personal here, I said I would. The rhetoric you hear from quote unquote Christians is actually rhetoric you're hearing from quote unquote Pharisees. It's a pharisaical heart and it rots your faith. The language around abortion in the church and women who have gone through that ordeal and walked through that ordeal is horrifying. Where's the love and compassion and graciousness? Remember the woman caught in adultery in the Bible? Remember what Jesus did? He scared off all of her attackers and then he put his arm around her and said, woman, go and sin no more for his love and his grace extended down there too and drew her up. What's your favorite people group to love to hate on? Sometimes we pick just the smallest little differences. Maybe it's not radically different people who look different than me. Maybe it's just a different denomination. Do you know which denomination I hate? Well, I'm going to fill in the blanks in your own head. They do baptism differently than us. Ooh, they don't focus on the Holy Spirit as much as we do. Or, ooh, you know, you notice how it's like with speeding, right? Anybody going slower than you is a moron. Anybody going faster than you is reckless. You and you alone have somehow found the perfect speed for this condition. And why are all these jerks on the road? 
Denominations are the same way, right? Oh, they're liberal. Ooh, because they're not talking about how much they hate homosexuality enough or something. I told you I was getting personal here. Ooh, no, but these people, they're fundamentalists. And they haven't had the revival that we've had or whatever your thing is, right? You've somehow found the perfect balance of theology. Your theology is, ap- is excellent, but the application is dangerous. We are called to love graciously. For you and I are not the gatekeepers to the kingdom of heaven. We are the announcers, the prophets, the people who can say, here comes the kingdom of God. In fact, when I first became a pastor... Uh, God spoke to me very clearly, and this is what he challenged me on. Anything you think you know, live for six months before you speak in church. Now, I'm not saying I do this well. I'm not saying I lived it well. Sometimes I just try to live it, and I can speak to you out of failure and difficulty and say, I know this is hard, but it's still in the Bible. So I'm not saying this is like, ooh, get yourself all holy before you speak. It was do it yourself. Do to yourself as you would preach unto others is like the silver rule for churches, right? Live it yourself. If you talk about your unloving neighbor who's so mean and always is cranky or whatever, you kind of sound mean and cranky and you're his neighbor too, so he's probably saying the same thing about you justifiably, so maybe bridge it with love and kindness. How about that? Love God, love your neighbor, love and pray for your enemy. See, loving God makes you a believer. Loving your neighbor makes you spirit-filled. Loving your enemy makes sure you're not a Pharisee. See, because you can't build a wall to protect the kingdom of heaven. You can only build a wall around yourself that keeps you out. That's it. That's all you can do. Woe to you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you lock up the kingdom of heaven from people, for you don't go in, and you don't allow those entering to go in. So, I told you there was something happy here. Well, how do we receive this? How do we walk with this? How do we live with this? Jesus tells us. He he unlocks, he gives us the key to our own gates. We gate ourselves off from the kingdom, but he gives us the key. The disciples are arguing in Matthew 18 about, you know, who's the greatest and trying to keep the children away. And, and in verse 3, verse 4, Jesus says, look, I assure you, unless you are converted, that's, 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 a, that's a mental word, unless your, your mind, your understanding, the spirit of your understanding is converted, and you become like children. Now, when he says this, I just want to pause for a second. I assume Jesus means a child who receives gifts and shares generously like my daughter, not like young Jason. Right? Mine! This is my bike. I don't want to share with my brothers because this is my bike that my grandpa gave me. Not like that. Like a gracious kid who is thankful for the gifts they're given and shares generously. If we receive the gifts of God and become converted like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child... This one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Look, the kingdom of heaven is really simple. God loves you. You were a sinner. You were saved by grace through faith. You trust in Jesus and his sacrifice, and you say, Jesus, man, I I trust you, Jesus. You were saved by grace through faith, not by your works, anything you did, so that nobody can boast. And that same gift and offer is available for everybody. And in fact, right now, I want to do two challenges. And I'll get to the Pharisee challenge in a second, the the believer challenge in a second. But right now, I want to challenge you. If you're new here, if you aren't a believer, if you've been here on the fringes, on the edges for a while, and you've been curious about this God thing, I actually want to extend an invitation for you to enter into the amazing life of discipleship and following Jesus that's available. There is nothing you have done. There's nothing that's been done to you that can keep you out from the kingdom of heaven. God's love is huge. His love is ferocious. His love is chasing you down. And so I want to invite you, if you would like to make that decision today, to follow Jesus. We're going to get everyone to bow your heads right now. Everybody all together. I don't want to single you out. If you've actually never made that decision to follow Jesus, I'd like to encourage you right now to make that decision. To give your junk to Jesus. To humble yourself. And enter like a child. 
And so I'm gonna invite you to pray. You can pray this prayer with me in your heart. You don't have to repeat after me right now. And if you pray this prayer for the first time, I'd like to invite you to come up and talk to me or go to the Welcome Center. We have some packages for you. And right now, I'd like you to just, in your heart, pray with me as we pray. Lord Jesus, I trust you. And I thank you for your sacrifice. And I wish to receive the love that you've given us. And I receive your kingdom into my heart. I know that you died for me for my sins to save me out of my position as a sinner. And in faith, I accept your grace. And I choose to follow you. And everybody gathered here said, amen. Now, I'm not done with you, though. I'm going to invite the band to come on up here at this point in time. But I have a challenge for all of us believers. See, if we want to trade a greedy heart for a thankful heart and trade self-righteousness for kindness, you can challenge somebody on a million things, but I prayed long and hard about what the challenge would be, and it's really quite simple. I want you to think of your enemy. When I say this, something comes to your mind. Who's your enemy? Who are you at war with? It can be another believer. It can be an unbeliever. It can be somebody from a long time ago in your life, somebody from recent. Who are you in contention with? And I want you to ask and pray every single day this week one simple question. How can I be and show the kingdom of God to that person? And then I want you to do that thing or say that thing. How can I be or show the kingdom of God? Now, if they don't receive it, they don't receive it. But if they do receive it, well, then truly there's a celebration in heaven for the kingdom of God has come to that household that day and Jesus is greatly pre pleased. So can I offer you that challenge? Are you good with that? So I want you to think about one of your enemies, somebody you have had that maybe dislikes you, maybe you dislike, maybe you've had a run-in with, maybe they're a believer, maybe they're not. Just think about your enemy and I want you to pray earnestly, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, by your spirit, can you inform me, can you enlighten me what is something I can do or say to this enemy, old or new, so that I can be the kingdom of God in that situation. And that's going to melt any fair cycle heart inside of each one of us as we become God's sacrificial love. I mean, he died for us, right? Certainly, we can make ourselves a little uncomfortable as we step out. And so I want to thank you this morning. Uh, there are some special takedown instructions because uh, Aaron Freed's funeral will be in here shortly afterwards, which I will leave for Kim to explain. Awesome. And we're closing worship. You want to bow your head with me in prayer right now. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, right now, we thank you for moving and enlightening us, breaking down walls and opening our hearts to the kingdom of God. We thank you that you are always moving, but we especially thank you right now, Lord God, that you are doing a new thing in this season. And we ask that you would enlighten us, <coughs> walk with us, move in us, and by your spirit that we could be a light to those in darkness around us. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen.